across the fence, a sure sign of spring and a Vermont way of life. We'll check on lambing season. But first, a small research project with big results. Good afternoon and thanks for joining us. I'm Judy Simpson. It started as a Vermont research project in 2016 involving cows and wood chips. The hope was that the research would be a small step forward in improving water quality on Vermont farms. Now we know it's working. In the winter months, pasture-raised cows are kept in what's called an outwintering area. Those areas are often made of concrete. They're expensive to build, and if they're not properly maintained, they can cause runoff into public waterways. So with an eye on improving water quality and animal comfort, UVM Extension tried something new. Here's Across the Fences, Rebecca Gollin. It's about 120 foot per head. So that's Joshua Faulkner is sharing something new with Vermonters. And today we're inviting um, farmers, service providers, um, just curious local folks. Um, there's some folks from the, the watershed group here today and, and we're, we just really want to show off the practice and, and let folks kind of poke around. Faulkner is the Farming and Climate Change Program Coordinator at UVM Extension's Center for Sustainable Agriculture. The big idea he's showing off is a new way to manage cattle during Vermont's long winters. It's essentially a barnyard that's, that's made out of um, wood chips. It's a little more complicated, but the gist of it is that farmers use a thick layer of wood chips instead of the gravel or concrete that are the norm in heavy use areas. When farmer Doug Kenyon was looking for options, he teamed up with Faulkner and UVM Extension to try something different. That turned out to be Vermont's first wood chip pad. I was apprehensive at first, quite a bit, but we need to do something to start complying with the regulations that are coming down. Faulkner first worked with this type of system in West Virginia and thought it would be a good fit for some Vermont operations. Having this one here in Wheatsfield, adjacent to the Mad River, has given him the chance to do the water quality testing and environmental monitoring that will determine if the model is viable for others. So far, he's been impressed with the results. It's, it's pretty innovative. Um, this is only the third one of these that's been built in the United States, so it's pretty new. Um, it's a different way of thinking about barnyards. It's a different way of thinking about wintertime cattle management. Um, so it's new, it's, it's, it can be used in beef systems, it can be used in dairy systems. Beverly McMullen came to see the setup in action. She's interested in whether this approach could work on horse farms. I thought that perhaps there would be some application for horse farming of this um, system that has been um, designed and built here at Kenyon's farm to uh, alleviate uh, mud and high tr in high traffic areas, particularly in the spring, on horse farms because that has been a problem in the past. McMullen thinks the practice has potential, and as a member of the Vermont Horse Council, as well as the Vermont Farm Bureau, she plans to share the information with her networks. Across the fences, Keith Silva caught up with Faulkner and Kenyon shortly after the wood pad was installed in 2016. We want to see how these perform in these really cold weather winters that we have here in Vermont. Um, so, so we're still learning, but by all accounts, um, it's, it's five degrees today and, and things look like they're working really well, so um, we're, we're optimistic. The cows are standing on about 12 inches of wood chips. Below that is a layer of drainage stone and piping that flows out to a nearby drainage pond. When the animals go back on pasture in the spring, the top three inches of wood chips will get scraped off, composted, and used as fertilizer on Kenyon's fields. Another environmental benefit is how well wood chips handle water. When you think about concrete, most of the rainfall on, the, the, the falls on the concrete with the manure runs off. You gotta deal with that water. You have to handle that water in a responsible way. When it rains on, to, on the wood chip pads, those wood chips soak up a lot of that water. And then they re-evaporate it and, and they kind of act like a sponge. I've done some research on a couple of pads and we've seen a a reduction in runoff of about 50%. So that's 50% less dirty water that you have to deal with. Um, and, and I think that's a real advantage when you think about um, the infrastructure you need, whether it's a holding pond or some sort of treatment system, um, pumping and spreading. 
of, of how much money, time, and labor you have to put into dealing with that dirty water. And of course, you know, less dirty water you have, the less risk you have of, of potentially polluting. Kenyon's decision to install a wood chip pad aligns with the Vermont Agency of Agriculture's new required agricultural practices to limit runoff and improve water quality. We all are going to have to come into compliance with the runoff into the water systems and this is supposed to help mitigate that and hopefully it does. It, it's a step in the right direction. I like the idea of this system better than the alternative that I was offered. Now that it's been close to a year, Kenyon has more to say. The cows are more comfortable. I don't have to lock them in a tight area, which I won't do. And uh, they were comfortable all winter. It worked. Um, I, I'm impressed with it. I really am. And if we can do another one someday for the brood cows, I would do that too. It just makes a lot of sense. A lot less labor, a lot less mess, a lot less everything. The quality of the water really shows how well we're taking care of the land. And we really care about taking care of the land so that we can see that we're doing a good job in the water. As executive director of the Friends of the Mad River, Corey Miller is keeping an eye on how things are going here. Uh, Doug's trying something new and it's exciting and it seems to be um, a win for the animals and for um, the uh, environment at the same time and that's exciting and um, I think it's, it's something to see how, how it goes and if it's, if it's possible that other farmers might be interested that, that could be really neat. Miller is looking forward to getting more information on the long term and economic implications of using the system. Economically, I'd be interested to know how much it's going to cost and if it's something that's sustainable over time or if it's too much of a, be a burden to the farmers. Um, I'm, I'm intrigued by the, the long-term maintenance costs and if, that, if, it, if it's worth, um, if the, the additional costs are worth the reduced labor, it could be a, an exciting thing. Another economic boost could be for Vermont's timber industry in producing the wood chips. That possibility brought UVM Extension's Chris Lindgren, who focuses on forest product businesses. Mainly curious about uh, the application of using wood chips, which is a forest product, and wider use of wood chips. Lindgren, too, is reserving judgment until the data is in. Well, right now I'm really thinking about costs um, on both sides, you know, how it could help loggers who are businesses selling wood chips, um, could it help them um, keep their businesses, grow their businesses, and then the cost, is it cost, you know, is it the right cost that people are going to adopt the practice um, so that it'll be widely utilized, and then what are the sort of maintenance costs, and then the maintenance, um, again, on the selling side, how much maintenance do they need of wood chips as far as, again, another market for um, loggers. Faulkner hopes that by seeing these new practices in action, the farmers and industry representatives here will help spread the word. The wood chips aren't suitable for every operation, but Faulkner believes it could be just right for some. I think this could work on a, on a lot of farms in Vermont. Um, you're always constrained with some engineering practices by the site. You know, if, if there's shallow bedrock or high water tables, things like that, I mean, there, there, there are going to be those situations. Um, but really, you know, I think it can work on most, it can work on a lot of farms and especially some of our smaller farms and, and some of the medium sized farms. I think it's a really good fit for that. It's a, it's a Vermont, I've said this before, it's a Vermont scale practice. As for Doug Kenyon, he has some advice for farmers who are interested. If they could put one together and it helps the environment like they're asking us to, then try to figure out how to do it. And, and get an engineer to help you design it with the soil that's available and the amount of animals you want to keep. Um, look into it at least. Bringing Vermont-sized solutions to Vermont businesses and helping farmers think outside the box. In Wheatsfield, I'm Rebecca Gollin with Across the Fence. Thanks, Rebecca. Our next segment involves a retired extension livestock specialist. Longtime viewers will remember Chet Parsons. For decades, Chet was known around the state as the sheep guy. Even though he retired a few years back, that doesn't mean Chet's been put out to pasture, not unless he's tending his own flock. Just recently, Chet welcomed some new members to his flock. And a warning, those new members may be too cute for their own good. Here's Chet.
We're at the Parsons Farm in Richford, Vermont. Uh, I'm Chet Parsons with my wife, Kate. We've been raising sheep here for probably the last uh, 30 years or so. Uh, we're supposed to, supposed to be we're supposed to be retired, but uh, <laughs> during lambing we're probably working harder than we've ever worked. How many lambs on the ground this year, Chet? Uh, we've got just about 80, just about 80. Yeah. They started lambing about St. Patrick's Day, and we got the majority of them lambed in the first two and a half weeks or so. Of course, that's when it turned super cold, uh, which is, I guess, that's farming. <laughs> that's the way it works. So it was a little, little trying this year, but you know, you hope to have nice, easy weather. It makes it a lot easier to, to deal with. One day, I think we had uh, five sets of twins and a set of triplets. Is that common? <laughs> well, it usually happens once or twice during lambing when, when it all happens, but. You know, with 80 lambs, you've got to get more than one a day. Between my wife and I, we spend quite a lot of time in the barn when they're lambing. You know, you've got to make sure. You, and and I've, been, I've been raising sheep that are pretty good mothers, so, you know, I don't, don't uh, we don't have to do that much as a rule. But you do have to take care of them when you get when you get on get up here and you find lambs. We put them in a lambing pen, you know, so give them a few days to get attached to each other, you know, so we can watch them and make sure they're doing okay. And then they get turned out with the rest. Sometimes you get some that don't have enough milk, and you have to supplement the milk. Uh, that's usually true with triplets. Usually sh the mother doesn't have enough milk to feed all three. And sometimes you get an older ewe that's put all of her energy into having two beautiful lambs, but she doesn't have enough milk to feed them, so you have to supplement the milk. It's, it's just part of the game. Are they rambunctious? Sometimes they form a lamb pack and tear around the barn here and kick up their heels and have a great time. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, but other times they're just happy to just lay and sleep and, you know, eat and sleep. <laughs> the singles that really grow fast, you know, they'll be ready for market in probably five months or so. The majority will be more like six or seven, and then there'll be some stragglers that'll drag later than that, but yeah. But, but our plan is to get them up and going in good shape before grass gets here. And then when grass gets here, because they're, they're pretty much totally grass fed and grass finished. I don't feed any grain. I do feel, feed some alfalfa pellets. Right now the lambs can get in the creep and get alfalfa pellets if they want. And when the mothers are in the lambing pens, uh, they get a little extra in the form of alfalfa pellets. But I don't feed any grain. Well, if you think you're going to get rich doing it, don't do it because it, it's a challenge. But um, and an, another thing, there aren't good markets available, so you pretty much have to develop your own markets, which we've done over the years, uh, and that's always a challenge. Most most farmers like the idea of raising animals; they don't like the idea of selling their product. So sometimes that's been a challenge, but uh, we've we've been at it long enough, so we do pretty well. great to see Chet and his new arrivals. That's our program for today. Thanks for joining us. I'm Judy Simpson. I'll see you again next time on Across the Fence.